Well, good morning, everybody. Thank you for joining us and sticking with us. Yeah. This is our introduction, I suppose. This is. <laughs> I'm Kevin Barron. I'm the executive editor of Defense One. Um, and this gentleman next to me, you all know, is General Dave Goldfein, the Chief of Staff of the, Arm of the Air Force. Excuse me, we were just talking with uh, General Milley backstage, or General Milley was talking at us backstage, as he does. Um, <laughs> uh, so Defense One is the media partner for uh, the event here today and for the Future of War series with New America. If you haven't already, please go to defenseone.com and you can see us a long series of of articles and commentaries from the Future of War roster, ranging from everything from cyber to space to you know all sorts of all sorts of questions. Uh, a lot of which I think we're going to get into here today. Uh, we have 45 minutes. Uh, I've asked the group to give us a little more time for audience questions because uh, you know, we know this event. You guys have good questions. I'd like to hear more from you. I think more from myself for sure, uh, and we'll get some good answers. We hope from the general. Um, I'd like for us here to, to kind of to do a bit of around the world, but to keep it at the 40,000 foot level, to use my first Air Force metaphor. Um, I, I promised the general we'd talk a lot more about global strategy and, uh, and, and Russia, topics like that, and I, I will not use the phrase block by or get into any type of uh, acquisition nitty gritty, as usually I think he, he hears from, from that press corps. So, uh, let's let's kind of start at the top and we may move our way down. Um, and you've got some opening remarks too to talk about what's on your agenda. Um, well, let's do that first. Why don't you get us started with what you had to say, and then we'll we'll get going. No, thanks. And uh, I, I always love following General Mark Milley. He warms <laughs> up a crowd like nobody else, and uh, and he's a good friend. So it's great to be here. And again, thanks for having this conference. I thought what I might do is just spend a few minutes uh, opening up and talk a little bit about what it is your Air Force does every day around the world. Because one of the challenges that we have as an Air Force is quite frankly we do so much. And what we do is so broad that very often it's below the radar. You know, I liken it to, uh, to uh, you know, these lights in the room, you know. So I'm a, I'm a philosophy major right from the Air Force Academy that took six years to get through a four-year institution, right? So, so I mean, I'll tell you, I don't even actually know how these lights work, right? Uh, I think there's bulbs involved and electricity and wires, right? But here's what I know without question. Uh, my entire adult life, when I've walked into a room and flipped a switch, lights come on. So I've come to assume that light switches equal light. And I share that analogy with you because very often things that the Air Force does for the nation become similarly assumed, that uh, we can just expect that that's, it's always going to be available and always there. So let me just walk you through very quickly what it is that your Air Force is doing uh, right now uh, as part of this joint team and then open it up very quickly to a, a good dialogue. Because to understand your Air Force, you've got to think, look at it through actually two lenses. You've got to look at it through the lens of th that which we do deployed here in the homeland uh, in support of defense of the homeland and in support of the global challenges we faced. And then you've got to take an equivalent lens and then look at what we do when we are deployed forward as we look at assuring allies and partners, deterring bad behavior, shaping the environment, and then responding to crisis as required. So for that first lens, what do we do here in the homeland? It starts with nuclear deterrence. So your Air Force working side by side with the Navy uh, has two thirds of the nuclear triad, two legs of the triad. And on our worst day as a nation, our job is to make sure that the president is where he needs to be and that the commander in chief is connected to his nuclear enterprise. So first and foremost for us begins the nuclear enterprise and our responsibility for nuclear deterrence. And as you know, we're gonna be going into a nuclear, nuclear posture review in NPR and I'd love to talk about that. Then you've got to take a look at what we're doing in space. Twelve constellations in space that not only does the joint force respond, rely on, but I would say uh, nationally and internationally we rely on space capabilities. And space has become both a contested and a congested place. And so as the stewards of space since 1954, we take very, uh, very strongly our responsibility to the joint force for, for leading in terms of our capabilities relative to the space enterprise. And then it leads into intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance. How do we sense the globe through six domains, air, land, sea, space, cyber, undersea, and how do we knit that capability together into a common operational picture for decision makers? 
And so whether you want to talk about what we do remotely from places like Creech Air Force Base, flying sorties overseas in places like Syria and Afghanistan and Iraq, or whether you want to talk about the enterprise that takes the ones and zeros and turns it into decision quality information, that's a big part of what our Air Force does. And then the final piece I would talk about is what we're doing in the cyber domain. And this is all the services contributing cyber talent and building our cyber pool to both defend the nation relative to cyber threats and cyber attack, but also to bring capabilities that are non-kinetic in the business of war fighting. And so that's just that lens of what we do both here. And then you take a look at what we do forward. And for an Air Force, it starts with air superiority, ensuring that we have freedom from attack and freedom to attack and freedom to maneuver. And that's not an American birthright. And it takes that, we take that very seriously. We were just talking, talking previously with General Milley. You know, when a soldier, sailor, airman, or, or Marine are on the ground and they hear jet noise, I don't want them looking up ever. I want them to always know it's me so they can keep their eye on the enemy and do what they have to do. And so that requires us to have air superiority. And once we gain and maintain air superiority, we work through a, a series of bases that are global in nature, and we provide air power. And that starts with our global reach capabilities. And so about every two and a half minutes, even during this, during this dialogue, an aircraft's going to be taken off somewhere on the planet delivering supplies or personnel where it needs to go. Very often in, in bases that are not in the most secure locations, and our special operations forces are deployed forward to make that happen. And then when you talk about global strike, I can't give you a better example than what we did with the B-2s out of Whiteman. And when we send them 34 hours round trip to hit a target within 10 seconds of their planned time over target. And not only that, but 16 tankers that had to refuel them there and to get them back. And so not only do we fight the, the base, i.e. Whiteman Air Force Base, to get them airborne, but also all the things that go into making sure a global strike happens. And then finally, to ensure that we're continuing to attack the enemy in this hot fight that we're in. Um, you, know, we, you know, we very often look at that through the lens of the end game, i.e. what happens when a bomb actually hits the ground or we take out an enemy. But quite frankly, you have to look at the entire enterprise and the family of systems that come forward from the bases that we fly off of to the tankers that then refuel them, to the command and control, to the ISR, to everything coming together and connecting that to space to ensure that we're doing the nation's business forward. So that just gives you a snapshot of what it is your Air Force is doing every day, both deployed at home and deployed forward. And I look forward to talking about any of those capabilities or others as we go into the questions. Okay, that's, you know, that's a nice uh, sweep around the world of, of what the Air Force does. Uh, and I, I would guess you're right that a lot of the audience, or maybe not this audience, but the general public is less aware of those actions and daily capabilities than what we hear in the press more of. Uh, on the ground fighting. Um, so let's, let's start. I, I, we, we spoke backstage. We're at the start of a new administration. We have a new president. You and the other Joint Chiefs have had a few meetings with him already. Uh, you know, tell us, wh what's this new commander in chief like? What, what is it like to interact with him uh, when you're presenting your plans? And, and how, what, is, what kind of questions is he asking of you? So far, my impression in the couple meetings that I've been in with him is, uh, is first of all, uh, very thoughtful, a good listener. And uh, I've been impressed with not only the quality of the questions, but also the quality of the team he's put around him. So it's early to tell for all of us. We're watching to see sort of how things settle in the administration, where, where power centers. Um, we're still watching to, to see and understand better how, uh, what's his decision calculus and how does he make decisions? How do we present best military advice to him and his team in a way that can allow them to make the decisions in a you know, present enough information that he and his team are comfortable being able to provide a decision and then give us guidance that we can execute on. And so, so far, I would, I would describe the environment that I've seen so far as being, uh, I think we're all very optimistic. Uh, I'll just give you one uh, vignette that was pretty telling for me. Uh, so th when the transition team was going through transition, each of the chiefs had one-on-one -on -one time with the transition team, and then we had a larger group discussion. And we were in the dialogue in the larger group discussion, and, and, and one of the transition team members uh, brought up a question. He said, well, wait a minute. He goes, have you thought about you know, doing this a little bit differently? Maybe you can consider, and just about that time, the team lead, uh, who was uh, retired General Kellogg, who's uh, now in the National Security Agency, uh, a National Security Advisor, uh, Chief of Staff, he stopped him. He said, stop. 
and he, and he looked at me and he says, hey, chief, uh, pardon me for a minute. I just got to reset the room a little bit. And he looked at the transitioning team and he says, we're not here to offer ideas on how to mitigate risk. We're here to listen and understand exactly what this chief and this service is telling us so that we can help craft the president's 100-day plan. And I, I was actually really impressed with that focus. You know, so uh, I'll just give you that just give you that one vignette in terms of at least what we've seen so far. This has been from awesome. a, from a retired general. Yeah, yeah, and the team. All right, that's I think that's good insight. So if you, how what, what's the status of new strategy coming out? We 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 know there's a new counter ISIS plan on the table. That's we we're, we're it's, we've heard it's there, but we don't know. But even beyond that, usually the way it works with a new administration or a new four-year time, you, we get a we get a national security strategy out of the White House. There's a defense version strategy of it, or if it's a QDR year at the Pentagon that the secretary has to put his thumbprint on, and then correct me if I'm wrong, then it gets to the chiefs who can then decide how help or offer up their advice how to staff it, equip it, make it happen. Yeah, is that the order of things right now? Uh, somewhat. I will tell you that in uh, in. In preparation, I, I give a lot of credit to General Dunford uh, in terms of where he has focused the Joint Chiefs because with his his authority is is a convening authority of the Joint Chiefs, and so within the tank, which is the it's a conference room that the chairman owns where we all meet, he's he's been very focused on establishing the Joint Chiefs as architects of global campaigns. Uh, when I say architects, obviously, this is about best military advice, right? So clearly not saying that we have decision over authority on strategy or policy, but rather that we look at the global challenges we face, acknowledge the fact that each of these global challenges that we're looking at are trans-regional in nature, meaning they don't live within the confines of a combatant commander map, mm. right, or, or, or our maps. That, that the Russia challenge is actually not, while it may be a lead UCOM challenge, it's not just the UCOM commander that's driving to work worried about that challenge. It's actually a, you know, simultaneously a UCOM, AFRICOM, STRATCOM, uh, NORTHCOM, SOUTHCOM, CENTCOM, you know, TRANSCOM. I mean, each one of these combatant commanders drives to work concerned and thinking about their role in supporting a global campaign relative to the Russia challenge, as one example. And so where General Dunford has focused the Joint Chiefs is to look at these trans-regional challenges and uh, work with the combatant commanders to develop these global campaigns that we can then present to the Secretary of Defense. And then the Secretary of Defense, at the same time, is doing a strategic defense review. And that strategic defense review is looking at not only the global challenges, but also each of the services and, and, and where we sit right now relative to our readiness, relative to our current makeup of what we bring to the fight, what we are focused on relative to roles and missions. And so he has that going on, and our hope is that what we have, what we have worked on will actually feed into that review. So that's really sort of where we sit right now. So it's not necessarily an out-of-order uh, no. series of events to... Just because we've heard you and we've heard all the chiefs, frankly, since I think the fall have put forth either documents or op-eds or made public appearances, everyone's asking for more. Yeah. Everyone wants more soldiers, more airmen, everyone wants more aircraft and more ships, and everyone wants to be more forward deployed. Nobody's waiting around for the, for the White House to say, here's Trump's vision for the world, which frankly we haven't heard in any details yet from that administration. Yeah, but you gotta remember that for, uh, in the business of best military advice, I believe it's my responsibility as the chief staff of the Air Force because as a service chief, you know, primarily my job is to organize, train, and equip and present ready forces to a combatant commander so that combatant commander can accomplish that mission that, that he or, or, or she was given. Um, so in that regard and understanding what objectives the, the, the strategy is asking us to achieve, my job, along with all the other service chiefs, is to tell you from an air component standpoint, this is the force required to accomplish those objectives. And then it's the Secretary of Defense that then looks at all of the forces together and says, all right, well, here's, here's what we think we need to actually accomplish the strategy. So I don't think we're out of order at all. As a matter of fact, you know, 
planning is a journey. It's not a destination, right? We're we're always, you know us. I mean, we're always in the business of planning. And you know, yeah, I get the emails of all the <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, think the about doctrines it. and the in the plan. Yeah, sure. For sure, for sure. And then and you know, whoever said it is right, right? It, sometimes the value of that endeavor is not the plan; it's the planning. Well, how does that play into so that if there's a there's a, there's a current public worry that there's there might be too much control going to generals in this administration because of um, the deference it seems whether it was you know appointing a, like a Mattis or a Kelly or because this is a you know a president that comes from a different world it's not part of the Washington establishment this idea that he's just going to you know give the give give CENTCOM more control over ops give you know the chiefs more control over everything and just have a little too much trust I mean I'm asking a general yeah. do you think you have too much control right now or it's trending your way too much no it's a good no it's a good question actually because I, I do believe that it's 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 important for us to remember in terms of being military service chiefs and members of the military in general that it's my obligation I actually during a confirmation hearing swore that I would give my best military advice and speak truth to power, even if it didn't agree with the administration at the time, right? So it's my obligation to give best military advice, but I gotta, that I gotta make sure I remind myself that it's actually not the civilian leadership's responsibility to take my advice. And that's an important distinction, right? Because when I think about national security, Here's my window. I'm looking at it from a, how do I assure allies and partners? How do I deter bad behavior? How do I shape the environment? How do I respond to a crisis if I need to, right? And so I'm thinking about you know, this from, from a military operations. Let me describe for you what's not on my radar. Wall Street. I don't think about Wall Street from a national security. It's not in my job jar. Amtrak. I don't drive to work thinking about Amtrak. I don't think about our airports. Um, I don't think about the electrical grid running our cities. It's not my job jar. So when I offer best military advice, I got to understand walking in that I'm going to have this discussion with folks who have a much broader perspective relative to the business of national security. And sometimes my best military advice is going to fit, and sometimes it won't. And I got to be, uh, I got to be okay with. Uh, with that and understand that. I, I also got to under, understand, I think we need to understand that, that as long as it's respectful, creative tension based on the culture that each of us brings, based on our background, our experience, our, you know, what our organization is, you know, I would offer that you and I probably have a different approach to it, the same problem. If, if that bottle is something that we need to remove, you and I are gonna approach that differently. I'm gonna approach it from my background and perspective, you're gonna approach it from yours. As long as you and I can have a, a respectful dialogue about our different approaches to that, we're actually gonna to come to a better solution having that dialogue than if you're not in the discussion or I'm not in the discussion. So in terms of the, you know, do we have too many generals, not enough generals, what have you, I would just offer you that as long as we have got respectful tension and we have the right cultures represented, in the team that's bringing the president options, we're going to be just fine. Respectful tension. I have to remember that. That's a good one. Uh, and the time is eating away. I want to get to some more topics. Um, let's, from what you said, let's, you mentioned before about your forces. Uh, right now, we're in a state where we're hearing, again, that either, either the military is in a state of disrepair and it needs rebuilding from one perspective or from, as we heard in a million speeches last year from the Secretary of Defense, it's the world's greatest, or finest fighting force the world has ever known. You can't be both, can you? Well, uh, you gotta understand, the, again, the, the, Which is the it? obligation. It's actually not a one or a zero discussion, I would argue. It's not a, it's, this is not a black or a white discussion because. Imagine that. Yeah, because, but here's why it's important. All right, so back again. My job is to organize, train, equip, present ready forces. I'm also an international air chief. And so to our allies and partners, some of them who are in this room, I have an obligation as an international air chief to be thinking about my partner air forces and how we help build partner capacity uh, and learn from each other and share information into those things. And I'm a member of the Joint Chiefs. So uh, when it comes to are we ready as a military service today to take on the challenges and win? The answer to that is yes, absolutely. Uh, we, will, uh, we will win. 
Uh, it may take us longer than we'd like. Um, we may have, uh, you know, challenges in the opening days, but there ought to be no question in anybody's mind who may be listening, both internal to this room and external audiences, that uh, the joint force will win. Now, every- But, but you're short 700 pilots or 1,000 pilots, which is it now, the, what's the- So this is the next piece of it. Yeah. Now, um, would you ever want me as a chief uh, represent the air component and a member of the Joint Chiefs to not be thinking about this is the last week of peace that we have and preparing the force for, for conflict, the future of war? Absolutely. You would expect me to be laying out what, are the, what is it that I got to do to move forward? What comes next? How do we ensure that we're always moving forward, that we're thinking about procurement in new ways in the information age, that we're thinking about how do we connect you know, all the different platforms and sensors and apps and apertures and things that we as a joint force bring to the fight. How do I continue to think about the connective tissue that brings it all together? Because th the reality is we don't send, I mean, one of our great advantages as a joint force and a coalition force, we don't send silver bullets to a fight. There's not a single platform you can talk about in any of the service chiefs you're gonna have sit here that is gonna be the one piece of the joint force that's gonna dominate and win. The reality is we are completely interdependent, right? This is an air, land, sea, space, cyber force that goes forward. And so uh, for us, we're always thinking about what it is our shortfalls, how do, we, how do we move forward, how do we ensure they have the size force we need to be able to dominate in all those domains, especially in the global security environment that we just described. Right, all right, so we're gonna to move to Q&A from the audience now, and I, I encourage everyone to think about, because I still wanna know, the status of, of Russia and these flybys. China's pushed in, in, in moving, them, moving their dominance area beyond their shores. And um, about your, what, what you said, and we were down in Orlando at the Air Warfare Conference, and I'll, I'll lead in the first question to this. Um, at that conference, I heard several of, of the, your subordinate commanders, or I guess the guys from PACAF and USAFE and others saying, we need to push more forward, more forces forward. We need to be more forward deployed. We need to be places where we're, we're able to respond more quickly. Um, and I asked it then in a very, but I'll ask, I'll ask for, for here, the same kind of question, is, is this new? Is the Air Force asking for a global war footing and is, is this a direct response to Russia, to China? Why are we hearing this now? Uh, probably be, for a number of reasons. First of all, though, it's, I think it's important to look at the framework through which we as Joint Chiefs are looking at the global security environment and we call it the four plus one. General Milley may have talked about it, which is the China, Russia, Iran, North Korea, violent extremism right, no particular hierarchy there, but these are the five global challenges that we believe that we have to be ready to do those things which a military does, right? Because uh, I walked, you know, I walked you through before, we gotta first of all assure allies and partners. They have to have confidence that we are there, that we're with them, that we'll meet our obligations, that we have the capacity, the will, everything we need to do, right, to be able to, to assure our allies and partners. The second thing we need to do is deter bad behavior. And deterrence, the math equation hasn't changed over time. It's capability times will. And it, the times is important because if either of those on each side of the equation are zero, it equals zero, right? So we gotta make sure that we, have, we are out there and we are deterring bad behavior. And then we are shaping the environment. And that shaping of the environment is, quite, is, is a whole of government approach. It's the military element when combined with the economic uh, aspects of what we do as a government. It's when we bring our diplomatic core into play. So it's shaping that environment. And then if required, we have to be ready to respond to crisis. The first three are actually very artful if you think about how we do that. And very often, I think what you find from us is that to do that most effectively, you've got to be there. You've got to be forward, right? It, you know. The, the daily negotiations that we have uh, with the Japanese government at Yokota relative to how we fly, where we fly, how we integrate with the Japanese Defense Forces, all those things, that's probably that daily dialogue 
is probably as important in the business of confidence building and assuring allies and partners as anything else we do. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't uh, say that what we're looking at is a war fitting. I think what we're acknowledging is the importance of being there to assure, deter, and shape. It's going to cost more money to not just, there's an ask for more forces and an ask for more equipment. Putting them out there, rotating them more, that adds to the equation. Let's move to the uh, audience questions if we can. We have right here in the front Colin Clark from Defense, Breaking Defense. <laughs> uh, Colin Clark, Breaking Defense, morning, sir. Uh, you mentioned the uh, broader perspective that civilians bring to uh, their jobs. There are only two civilians in the Pentagon right now who've been confirmed, and the rule is if you're an acting, you don't make decisions, you just keep things moving along. Uh, is this becoming a concern to you I, on the policy side and the acquisition side? Do you need people in? Yeah, thanks, Colin. And I would say not yet but I'm hopeful that we can start seeing some confirmations come through. Um, I'll just give you an example within the Air Force. There's nothing acting about our acting secretary. You know, secretary Dispro uh, is, is just absolutely spectacular. And uh, there's nothing that she's had to hold back. And in fact, she received fairly clear guidance from the Secretary of Defense that um, that she was not to hold back in terms of her responsibilities and her role as the secretary. So when you, when you, if you were to come into a meeting uh, within Air Force spaces in the Pentagon, uh, there's no acting. She's the secretary. And we're moving things forward. And quite frankly, I have not seen any slowdown in the pace of our being able to move forward since she has come on as the acting. Um, I can't speak for all the departments, but that's what it looks like in the Air Force. How about this new nominee for DepSecDef, uh, Patrick Shanahan, I believe his name, from Boeing? What's, what's your take on him? And as also to that, there's a, there's a um, I mean, do you have experience to then let people know? One of the immediate reactions to that from, you know, from the Twitter sphere was, oh, of course, a guy from Boeing, it's a big industry, and, and you're just going to be in, in bed with big industry. What, is, that, is that the reality, or is that, is that more of a myth? Yeah, I'd say it's more of a myth. You know, for, first of all, actually, we don't have any uh, background. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't think uh, he and I have had a chance to meet. You know, I'm looking forward to meeting him and obviously give him uh, and hope that the confirmation process goes well for him. Um, you know, more important for the uh, a service chief, quite frankly, is the is what is how uh, the secretary of defense and the undersecretary come together as, a, as an executive team because it's very similar to what happens to a service chief and a secretary, mm. right? Um, how well do we come together as an executive team with, again, a little bit of that creative tension we talked about beforehand that helps move the organization forward, uh, understanding that there's different perspectives that you bring to the table. So uh, I'll, I think for us, we'll be watching more. How does that team come together? You know, the, the good news is, uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of serving under General Mattis when he was the CENTCOM commander and I was his lead airman. And he gave us uh, some pretty clear guidance as, you know, as Secretary Mattis now is, uh, is, does. And he, I remember when, he, when we had our first meeting, he said, look, he said, uh, first thing I'll tell you is doctrine is interesting. It's a start of the dialogue, but we're not gonna get locked into service doctrine here. Um, we're gonna figure out how to fight together and the second piece of guidance he gave us is, and I expect vicious harmony amongst my component commanders. <laughs> and he got it. That's good. And, uh, and many of us now are serving together in different roles that were combatant, who we were component commanders at the time. So uh, no surprise, you know, Secretary Mattis has brought in the same kind of very clear uh, intent and guidance to the department, which is, look, you know, we've got, uh, this is a tough global security environment, and it's gonna require some vicious harmony with that creative tension that we talked about to be able to bring the commander in chief options that he can then look at and make a decision on which way he wants to go forward. So I think from, uh, I'm not actually as concerned about what company a person came from or whether they're industry or not. I'm more interested in how do we come together as an executive team? All right. 
vicious harmony and creative tension. This is, yeah, but we're don't, at, uh, don't uh, you know, I mean, harmony is not all singing kumbaya as you run off the cliff together. I was going to say, it sounds like one of Tom Rick's you know, military bands. That, yeah, no, 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 <laughs> no. This is all not, right. this, is, this is speaking truth to power. Mm -hmm. this, is having a, this is having a good, honest debate. I have a question, this gentleman in the blue shirt on the aisle? Do have the microphones? Yeah. It's right there. Thank you, General. Appreciate it. Um, your, uh, your friend um, just spoke, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Jordan Barth, uh, American University. Um, your, your friend just spoke a little while ago about um, the need for, for new talent uh, and the need for recruiting uh, in, in the future. What, um, what is the Air Force going to be doing in the future uh, to recruit um, and, and nurture uh, millennials? Uh, and the people who uh, take the places of those serving. Good question. Those 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 lazy, needy millennials we hear so much about. How, do you, how are you going to use them in in the Air Force? Some of them might be in the Air Force already. Yeah, you know, I'll tell you what. Uh, we're all we're all in uh, competition for talent out there, and what we need to continue to f focus on. You know, if you go to a high school and you look at, you know line up the kids in that high school and ask yourself the question, who joins each line? Who joins the line to become a Marine? Who joins the line to become a soldier? Who joins the line? And, and, and the reality is, I believe, that those great young Americans who choose to come forward are looking to find themselves in the organization. They're trying to find a culture that they fit into. And as an airman, I think of the Air Force as the big tent service in many ways. Because as these kids line up, I'm going to have a kid get to that front of that line and say, I want to be a JTAC. I want to, I want to, you know, I want to join and I want to be able to be in there and call in air power. I want to be right there with my light infantry counterparts the entire way. That's a certain kind of kid, right? And, and that kid's got to find himself or herself inside the Air Force and as, and as a good fit. And then right behind that kid is a summer that says, I want to be, I, I want to, I'm, I'm fascinated with cyber. And I want to join this cyber mission team and be able to go out there and think about the future of cyber. And you know what? That kid's got to find themselves inside the United States Air Force and our culture's got to welcome them and make them feel like they're part of it. And right behind that kid is another kid who comes and says, I've always wanted to be an astronaut. And if I can't be an astronaut, I want to be an engineer. And, I want, and, that, and that kid's got to find himself or herself inside the United States Air Force. So where we are focused is ensuring that we're a, we, we are a force that these kids want to join. That, you know, I'll give you one quick vignette. So um, General John Hyten, when he was Air Force Space Command, drove into a parking spot at Joint Base lewis McCord up in Washington State. And the car pulls in right next to him, and it's a Tesla S. And out of the Tesla S jumps a senior airman. And General Hyten called him over and said, hey, airman, so tell me, uh, how, how is it that uh, you know, a senior airman can drive a Tesla S? And the kid was a little bit older than usual, and he says, well, he said, I'm a, I'm, I'm a reservist, I'm part-time, and in my full-time job, I'm the director of security for uh, a major, you know, Amazon, Google, right? I mean, the director of security is a senior airman in the Air Force Reserves serving in the United States Air Force. We don't pay that guy tip money, <laughs> right? So why in the world? Would he want to give up his weekends? He wants to serve. He wants to be part of something bigger than himself. He wants to protect the nation. And so we got to be a service that's, that, that can go out and get these kids to come in. That's the, that's the competition we're in. Question here in the front row. Switch to this side and try to come back. Hi, I'm Pat Host with Defense Daily. Uh, General, you talked about these intimate confidence building measures. Uh, what other nations are you involved in this right now? And what kind of costs are incurred with this? You know, Air Force doesn't have an unlimited budget. Maybe what a other areas of the service are you making sacrifices to pursue more of these me measures? Yeah, so we, you know, the reality of coalition uh, 
warfare, when you can bring a coalition of the willing together, is the same challenges very often that we face in our discussions about, you know, uh, boots on the ground, right? How, how many times have we had the discussions about this number of soldiers, that many soldiers, that many this, right? So we, so those conversations that we have here uh, are replayed in many of the countries that we go to to ask them to join a coalition of the willing because of our common interests. Uh, unless these countries have access to ports, very often they don't procure navies. So what most countries actually have when it comes to offering the military component of a coalition is an air component because it's not geographically bounded and they will normally procure an air component to defend their borders, their sovereignty, and to provide security for their nation, right? So, so through that lens is where I look at my responsibility as an international air chief. So how do we as an Air Force, ensure that we are continually improving our ability to build partner capacity, to build partner Air Forces, and help sustain partner Air Forces that can then become part of a coalition. I mean, right now, General Harrigian has 16 nations that are fighting together in the air uh, over Iraq and Syria. And so every day, coming together and putting that uh, choreography together is again, it's sort of like a light switch, right? We assume that coalition warfare is something that's you know, rather simple to do, but it's anything but. And we, you know, Hap Arnold, uh, during the darkest days of the daylight bombing campaign in World War II had a fascinating quote. You know, when we were losing up to 20, 30% of our force on a given mission, he said, you know, the problem with air power was we make it look too easy. <laughs> I often wonder what would Hap Arnold think today? You know, because we do make it look fairly easy when it's anything but. So through that lens of my responsibilities as an international air chief is how I view the whole how do we engage with partner air forces, right, to ensure that when the commander in chief is looking to you know, operate by, with, and through, that we have any number of nations that are available that, have, that bring capability, that bring readiness, and that we're interoperable when we go forward. Well, I'm going to bring the question more to a pinpoint then for the ISIS war and for the expanded war on terrorism across um, AFRICOM and CENTCOM, uh, you know, there's an expectation it's going to keep going at the level it's at, if not more. I mean, perhaps the, the air campaign specifically over Iraq and Syria is, is winding down in the future, but this is a much larger geographic area. Do you have the, the forces and the equipment, especially ISR, to cover that area right now, or is that a, is that a real concern for any, any request to increase? It depends on what else we're doing. You know, when we have the discussion about, uh, give me a say your readiness, I, I always have to come back and say, if we're, gonna have, if we're gonna have an informed discussion about readiness, you have to first answer the question, ready for what and when? Because until you actually understand those two components of the question, you really can't give a good answer. So if the answer would be, do I have the force that's required to sustain the current fight at its current operational tempo for the next 10 years, and that was all I was doing, my answer is absolutely yes. I can sustain this. I've got the force I need. Now, when you walk the line at Bagram, and when you walk the line right at Al Udeed, mm -hmm. what you're gonna see is my highest level of readiness. You're gonna see parts on the shelves. You're gonna see supervision forward. You're gonna see 100% manning. You're gonna see us hitting aircraft failability rates that, uh, that, I, that I, I would never be able to hit, but there's a bill payer. And the bill payer to get that level of readiness forward is all the bases that we have here that, that contribute the forces required to get that level of readiness. If you then walk the line at Shaw Air Force Base, at Dias Air Force Base, you would see significantly lower readiness. But if that's all I'm doing, I can accept that risk. Now, if what you're asking me is, are you ready to continue to sustain that op tempo while at the same time ensuring that we have a safe, secure, reliable nuclear deterrent, which I will never back away an inch from, while you also now ratchet up homeland defense and General Robinson asks for more forces to be able to defend the homeland because if something's going bad abroad, mm -hmm. we have to assume that we're gonna have more requirements at home. But well, you're pushing more F-22s into Japan and so sending bombers over Korea. That's and... right, so it's, it, it becomes a simultaneity discussion. Mm -hmm. at, at what point is, are we now having a dialogue of not are you ready to do just what's going on in the Middle East, but are you ready to be able to do that simultaneously with the fact that from an air component standpoint, 
and Air Force, if you study, as you study the operational plans, upwards of 80% of the Air Force goes forward in the first, in the opening weeks of any campaign. So that's why you never hear the chief of staff of the Air Force talk about tiered readiness. I can't do tiered readiness because I don't have the time to be able to get that force ready to meet the combatant commander requirements forward. So you don't have the forces to, to do more, to go after Russia? To do, simultaneous, to do simultaneous conflict is where you start finding us having challenge. Now, going back to one of the questions you asked me before, yep. right, which is, um, you know, how, how, can you be, how can you say that you're ready to win today, but you don't have what you need for the future? It depends on which rheostat you're turning, right? If you're starting to turn simultaneous rheostats, on this force, it only has a certain capacity, and you do get to a readiness stop at which you no longer can, can support simultaneous activity on the globe. But you gotta, you, you gotta drive into the ready for what and when to have a meaningful discussion. Sounds like a lot of work for Congress head. Let's get this gentleman in the front has, what, has had his hand up, we'll do the last question. We're under two minutes, so make it really fast, and we'll ask the general to make it as fast as he can fly. Chris Miller, Air Force Academy. Chief, if I could uh, ask you to put your organized training and equip hat back on and go 20 to 30 years in the future, uh, to the future of war, uh, what do you see airmen, uh, systems, con ops, et cetera? So the, I think the, yep, and, I, and I think the key on this, uh, Chris, is network. How do we network military capability so that we can first of all, create this common operational picture for a decision maker so we can achieve a decision speed that our adversaries can never match. And then part of that decision speed is I can create multiple dilemmas from all domains as a global chess master, as a global superpower, that that in itself becomes a deterrent force. And that we have built this into a, an, an, an environment where we build enough resiliency in the network so that if a portion of it is taken away from us, which we have to expect, our answer is bring it. I've got all of this other capability over here that you can't touch. And so the key for me as Chief Staff of the Air Force is how do we think about this in terms of a network? How do we move beyond a discussion about trucks and cargo? and actually have a meaningful discussion about the highway it rides on? And how do we connect military capability in a way that can produce effects at a way that no enemy on the planet can ever counter? That, to me, is the center of mass for the future. General, we're at the end of the time, and thank you, and I want to apologize. I know you wanted to talk about space. It's one topic I didn't get into, but I'll, I'll plug uh, everyone should go read the latest David Ignatius piece in the Washington Post. It was an interview with the general in his office specifically about space policy and what's happened. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a good kind of roundup of what we've heard from, from you guys before. Um, thank you for your time. Thanks to the New America, to the New America group. I hope you have a great conference. Uh, round of applause for the, the general, please. Thank you.